Joe Salerno has been very um, precise in uh, giving the title to this uh, talk, <clears throat> The Economics of Fractional Reserve Banking. That means we will set aside uh, for uh, this uh, discussion uh, legal questions. We're, we're not really interested uh, as economists primarily in legal questions, you know, whether fractional reserve banking is fraudulent or under what kind of configurations legally it's you know, permissible in the private sector and so on. These are interesting questions, but, <laughs> but again, we want to focus on the economics and uh, for maybe too long, uh, there's been an overemphasis perhaps in the literature on these uh, legal uh, questions. It's not to say that I won't bring up a few legal issues, but uh, it won't be the focus of our uh, discussion. Okay, with that, uh, let's uh, just review uh, real quickly uh, something that uh, we had in a previous lecture yesterday uh, where uh, Dr. Engelhardt uh, spoke about the uh, development of money on the market. And here, uh, following uh, Menger's uh, famous uh, <clears throat> presentation, uh, we see the logic of how money arises on the market through uh, the uh, selection by uh, people trading in a barter economy of a uh, saleable good, a readily saleable good that they can use to make indirect exchange. <clears throat> and that this readily saleable good must be something already traded on the market. It must be some good that's uh, being exchanged already. There must be money prices, or prices I should say, exchange ratios uh, in uh, this commodity for it to be selected uh, by people as the medium of exchange. Now, <clears throat> once the commodity is selected as the medium of exchange, whatever it happens to be, and is sort of uh, improved by entrepreneurial innovation over time. So live cattle and raw tobacco and cocoa beans are given up for uh, precious metal and uh, so on. Uh, entrepreneurs will take the next step in, in the market all on their own initiative to uh, certify the money. Because without certification, the uh, silver nuggets or the gold dust or the raw commodity uh, that people would be using as a medium of exchange would have to be weighed and assayed each time a trade was made. So the entrepreneur can have a successful business by uh, certifying the fineness and weight of the metal in, you know, with a stamp of certification to make coins, in other words. Uh, this would be a, a viable uh, business uh, activity. Uh, for which uh, entrepreneurs uh, would um, conform in their production to the standard uh, economizing uh, principles of production in the market that uh, we've all heard about this morning. Right? They would earn profit or suffer losses depending upon the cost of mining and minting equipment and you know, the labor they use and so on, and then the, the market value of their output, the market value of the, of the money that they produce. So, the, so money production uh, on the market, money proper, its production on the market, would be integrated into the regular economizing uh, processes of profit and loss. It, it, this, this is how money would emerge uh, on the market itself. Um, then, uh, secondly, we can uh, talk about, we can move on now to banking. Uh, banking would, uh, could arise for other reasons. We could have institutions that historically we've called banks. Uh, for example, making uh, money exchanges, uh, foreign currency exchanges. So banks uh, arose historically to do this function and to provide maybe, uh, let's say, uh, investment advice to rich clients and things like this. <clears throat> but eventually banks, once money comes into existence in a certified form, we have coins, then banks can engage in another entrepreneurial innovation to provide uh, certification uh, 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 separately from the coin itself. They can provide certification that they're holding uh, for redemption of the certificate holder uh, coins in reserve or in their vaults. Now this too is just a business uh, proposition. This would uh, succeed or fail based upon the profitability of uh, uh, offering this service. And so customers would pay a fee to have this uh, form of certification, maybe on paper like banknotes, or maybe uh, in uh, bank accounts, right, electronically, in checking accounts. Uh, they, so we, we would pay fees, or these customers would pay fees, and those fees would have to cover the costs of producing the money certificate, right, that, that warehousing the gold and uh, providing the banknotes, printing them up, or again, warehousing the gold and doing the accounting of the deposits and, and so on. Now, uh, the uh, customers then would uh, get, get a benefit from this uh, certification 
Uh, in terms of safety and convenience, it, you know, as we all know, it's easier to swipe debit cards um, or to write checks and put them in the mail than it is to lug around gold coins and, and so on. So there is, there is this benefit to the customer. And this benefit uh, not only accrues to the customer who, who receives the bank account or the uh, bank note, but also to what uh, in the literature we call the clientele who would be uh, accepting the money certificate in lieu of money itself. So we always would ask the, logical, the question logically, why would a merchant accept the money certificate, the bank note or the, or the uh, a bank account deposit, uh, instead of money itself? And the answer is, well, with the bank note, he gets the same convenience as the customer, right? He, he, th this, this benefit accrues to him as well. Or with the bank account, it accrues to him as well. And so, sure, he would uh, favor that, favor that form of the medium of exchange, uh, to some degree at least, relative to money proper. Right? So this, again, would just be uh, a regular business activity that banks would perform. Uh, it would, uh, their performance of this activity would uh, conform to the regular standard profit and loss calculation. If, if uh, we as customers wouldn't pay fees because we didn't find it as convenient uh, to do this, uh, that were high enough to cover the costs of providing the money certificate, then banks would not provide it. There's nothing wrong with that, right? It's just how the market would uh, configure production, as always in anything. The production is always configured to what we prefer more heavily. <clears throat> um, so, the, again, the, uh, we could imagine then the market, just logically thinking about this thought experiment, the market would develop these two different forms of the medium of exchange. Money proper, some commodity coinage, and then money certificates, claims to, uh, redemption claims to money proper. <clears throat> okay, now the next step is just to see what, uh, what effects this has on, on uh, both uh, banks and th there's financial effects on the banking system and uh, effects on the uh, broader economy. Now, again, uh, we can imagine different legal arrangements for the issue of uh, money certificates. And some of these would not involve the kind of uh, um, uh, banking uh, 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 implications that I'm putting up here on the PowerPoint. We could imagine, for example, we could imagine that uh, customers form a relationship with a bank when they get a money certificate <clears throat> that is simply a, a warehousing receipt. This is how Murray Rothbard, you know, introduced this uh, uh, idea uh, in his uh, writings on, uh, on money and banking, that the uh, banks would simply warehouse money for us, and the money certificate, the bank note, or our checking account balance is just a uh, title of ownership to the goods that the bank is warehousing. Now, if that's the legal arrangement that's made between the customer and the bank, then, then this wouldn't apply, right? The bank would not have the, the money proper as an asset on its balance sheet. It, it would just be storing the, the goods. Uh, so an analogy would be, uh, you're all familiar with those uh, you know, storage facilities for your personal goods that are along interstates, right? And you're moving someplace and you can put your you know, belongings in storage and then and, uh, get them out later and you pay a fee. So, so a bank could be like that legally, right? It could be that the customer owns the gold that, that's held by the bank and the bank is just warehousing the gold and the bank has paid a fee in order to keep the gold safe and, and to issue the bank certificate, the money certificate. <clears throat> but my assumption is different here. My assumption is that there's a legal arrangement. Because I want to do this just to make a contrast between this case and the case of fractional reserve banks. Okay, so that, that's the only reason to do this. So my assumption is that the banks uh, and the customers make an agreement to transfer ownership of the money to the bank in exchange for instantly redeemable claims to that money. Okay, so again, this is sort of weird and we don't need to go into the legal uh, niceties of this, that's not the point. The point is to simply make the contrast between what 100% reserve banking would look like, however it's legally configured, and fractional reserve banking. That's the, again, the main, the main point of this. Anyway, we can see that if, if the bank takes ownership of the money, so on the left-hand side, it becomes an asset, they own the gold now, and they, but they have a liability that, uh, against them in the checking account uh, of the customer. Right? So this is what it would look like. Now clearly, this, uh, the point of doing this is to uh, uh, highlight that if the bank uh, uh, proceeds in this way, 
that the issue of the money certificate does not impair the bank's liquidity. The bank is exactly as liquid as it was before it issued this, this uh, money certificate. It has an instantaneous uh, liability, the checking account. The customer can come back at any time. It's a demand deposit. The customer can come back at any time and cash out and get back the money uh, being held. <clears throat> and so it has an instantaneous liability and instantaneous asset. It's holding the gold on the premises. So the time structure of its assets and liabilities are not impaired at all by the issue of the money certificate. They're, they're, they're perfectly matched. Uh, by the way, Mises calls this matching of the time structure of assets and liabilities. He calls this the golden rule of finance. You know, if you run a business, you <laughs> need to pay attention to this, uh, you know, this, this issue of liquidity. There, there are two important uh, financial aspects of your balance sheet, right? Liquidity, which we're talking about now, and then solvency, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute. Now, the reason why this, this uh, transaction leaves the bank solvent is because the value, the actual market value of the assets and liabilities correspond. Right? That isn't always true, right? The, the, you, could, you could take on liabilities uh, uh, against asset values, and your asset values could fall in value, right? And then you would be insolvent to some degree. But if, you, if you're holding money proper, then the nominal value of the money is always the same. It, it, its nominal value can't go down. Right? So, and you're not issuing, well, this bank is 100% reserves, so it's not issuing uh, liabilities in excess of its assets. So it's perfectly solvent and liquid when it performs its function. It doesn't, no, nothing, nothing is impaired in the finances of the bank. Now, the other thing to notice here is that the issue of money certificates does not change the money stock in society. So banks have no uh, independent ability in a system like this to influence the overall stock of money uh, that exists in the, in the economy. And what the bank does is they take, they take money proper and they turn it into a reserve and they issue an equivalent amount of money certificates that then perform the function of the medium of exchange. Remember, uh, Austrians uh, always pay attention in, in an analyzing uh, uh, human action. We always pay attention to the uh, purpose or intentions of the actors. Right? That's, that's the crucial thing. We always trace back the analysis to the purposes or intentions of the actors and, 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 uh, and not, uh, not to mere objects. Right? So when we talk about money, we're talking about the, the item that people use as the general medium of exchange. We're not talking about a particular object like a gold coin or a, or a cow or a, a raw tobacco or something. That, that, that's a secondary issue. We're talking about the use to which the object is put, right? So if someone takes a, uh, to give you a modern example, someone takes, uh, you, you see this uh, frequently, right, in, at least in movies, somebody will take a dollar bill, the first dollar they earn as an entrepreneur, and they'll frame it on their, you know, put it up on their wall. Well, that's not a medium of exchange anymore, right? I mean, it's not, that, that's a consumer good now. He, he's just admiring it, he's showing, he's showing off to his friends, you know, my first dollar, so on. So, so objects are not the final arbiter of what the thing is. It's, it's the intention or use that people make. Okay, so anyway, the money supply does not change when this happens. Now, uh, oh my, something got cut off here on the, well, this is, you know, we're going to have a mystery speaker later in the week, so this is my mystery quote. Maybe I'll just ask this as a question since I had the author's name down there, I don't know where it went. Somebody's, somebody hacked my uh, PowerPoint. Okay, this is a quote from a famous economist. The bank money, bank money, speaking of the, these checking account balances, the bank money, just offsets the amount of ordinary money, gold or currency, placed in the bank's vault. No money creation has taken place. A 100% reserve banking system has a neutral effect on money and the macro economy because it has no effect on the money supply. Now, contrary to what you might think, that is not an Austrian economist who said this. This uh, came out of, or came from the pen of Paul Samuelson. <clears throat> so I call him to witness uh, to the veracity of this, of this uh, claim that uh, the Austrians make. This is a widely understood uh, implication of 100% reserve banking. <clears throat> okay, so now, oh, there it is. Look at that. <laughs> Paul Samuelson, 19th edition of his textbook, Economics. All right, so you can look that up. I, I didn't dream that. 
Okay, so here's our next, uh, let's just uh, run through a quick uh, diagrammatic analysis uh, because we're going to do the same thing again with uh, the issue of fiduciary media in a minute uh, just to see, just to kind of conceptualize the difference here. So let's suppose we start here at point, at point A in the money market. This is the total stock of money, the total amount of money uh, plus money certificates that people are using as a medium of exchange at any point in time. And this is the total demand to hold money. And so the purchasing power of money, just like the price of any good, is set by the interplay of demand and supply, right? So this, this again, is not uh, uh, do, doing anything uh, uh, special. We're just applying the regular marginal utility analysis of supply and demand to money. <clears throat> now, if, if nothing changed with respect to the demand and supply conditions in money, then the purchasing power of money would stay stable. That would just stay there at PPM, sub-zero. It wouldn't, it wouldn't change. Something must initiate a movement either in the supply or the demand side of the market, right? <clears throat> but uh, the argument that we're making here is that supply, at least through production, supply never changes independently of demand. Qu quite the contrary. Changes in supply through production are always dependent upon changes in demand. It's, it's only through an increase in demand the greater production is called forth because it generates greater profit, right? But if demand doesn't change, if demand stays here at TD0, then supply is not going to shift out here to TS1. It, that, that would never happen in the market. If demand for, uh, you know, uh, bags of apples stayed the same in society, there'd never be an increase in production unless, again, demand is changing for apples relative to other things, right? And the, the, so demands are always uh, based on preferences, which are relative, but if, there, if, it's, if it's stable with respect to all other things, which, which money demand would be, since it's being expressed against all of the goods, there'd be no, no reason to change uh, uh, production because this price would just be earning uh, the, the normal rate of return uh, from the production of, of money. So only if demand goes up, so if demand shifts out, then the value of money in the market goes up then there's profit to producing more money. And then that would set in motion then an increase in supply through production. And so we get this movement uh, to point B over time, and that a uh, higher uh, PPM is uh, justified by the, uh, 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 by the uh, increasing costs of production because of the principle of the law of returns we spoke about earlier, uh, involved in uh, extracting more gold and drawing resources out of more valuable opportunities to draw them into uh, coin production and so on. Again, this analysis is no different than the dynamic process uh, of increasing demand for any good in the market. Exactly the same argument uh, we would use uh, to explain that. <clears throat> so again, I give you this mainly for contrast, uh, uh, as we'll see with fractional reserve ba uh, banking uh, in a minute. Now, the other thing that uh, would develop uh, uh, in the uh, banking industry on the market is financial intermediation. Now here's where we get to a point of some uh, debate in the literature on the economics of fractional reserve banking. Uh, <clears throat> here I'm taking the, the uh, phrase intermediation just in the general sense of an uh, intermediary. So an intermediary is a go-between, right? So there are lots of intermediaries or middlemen uh, in the economy. <clears throat> so, for example, Walmart uh, performs the function of an intermediary or middleman. Uh, not, not in credit, right, but in uh, goods, in consumer goods. So they buy wholesale, they sell retail, they earn the uh, price spread as their revenue between wholesale and retail, and then that revenue stream they use to pay for their costs. Right? So they pay their for their buildings and their transportation and their labor and so on and so forth. So that's how middlemen operate generally uh, in the economy. So banks are middlemen in the credit market. That's what financial intermediation means. At least that's how we'll define it. <clears throat> so banks uh, borrow uh, funds from savers and they pay a wholesale interest rate and then they lend money to investors, the borrowers, and they earn a retail interest rate. Now, why would uh, customers put up, why would the savers put up with just receiving the wholesale rate? Why don't they go for the retail rate? You know, uh, why don't we try to buy directly wholesale? 
as customers? Why do we buy retail and pay the higher price? And the answer is the intermediary uh, provides services to us that we value. Uh, the main service that Walmart provides to us is no questions asked returns. I buy something at Walmart, I use it for a while, I don't like it, take it back, get a full refund. That's just some value to me as a customer, right? If I buy directly from the, from the producer, I, I probably would actually have to pay a higher price anyway because Walmart can get also a discount by buying in bulk that I can't get individually. But, uh, but, but I would have to deal with the producer if I wanted to return it. I, you know, I'd pay the shipping or I'd have to uh, you know, hassle with, with, with the, somebody on the phone or something and, and so on. So no, it's a, it's a great convenience to do this. Uh, some people uh, have a preference for actually, uh, you know, shopping in brick and mortar stores. So Walmart provides that too. I don't particularly hold that preference, but apparently some people do, and they, they just like to go to Walmart and uh, you know walk around and see what's available. And, and so there there are these benefits. Now, what about banks? Well, banks provide um, uh, benefits to to the savers. Of, for, for one thing, it, it's, a, it's a benefit of the division of labor. So if I'm going to uh, directly lend to an investor, you know, I have to uh, investigate on my own all of the uh, different uh, possible uh, lending uh, opportunities that uh, are, exist in the market. I would have to bear the risk directly of default by, by the person I lend to. <clears throat> but the bank uh, uh, will absorb that default, right? Because my contracts with the bank, I still have the problem of assessing the creditworthiness of the bank to pay me back. But at least that's just one institution, right? And not that I can be more familiar with, perhaps, as a customer in the market than uh, you know some far-flung entrepreneur that I might lend to, or or some some let's say neighbor who's trying to start a business that I might be kind of talked into lending money to because well he's my neighbor and I want to you know keep up good neighborly relations or. Maybe he's my ne'er-do-well uh, brother-in-law or something like this. Okay, so there are some you know, benefits and this uh, to, the, to the saver, and this generates the interest rate spread. That in and of itself generates the interest rate spread. The interest rate spread is not, it does not require a bank to leverage in order to create an interest rate spread. That's not financial intermediation. That's just risk, uh, that, that's just risky, uh, investing strategy, you know, a riskier investing strategy, right, to leverage. We'll talk more about that as we go along. But what we're saying is not that the banks can't leverage. We're just saying that even if they don't leverage, there's an interest rate spread that's available to them from what we're calling financial intermediation, borrowing from savers and lending to investors. They're the middleman. <clears throat> okay. Now, when they do this, um, uh, when they intermediate credit, it again, does not impair, or at least not necessarily, it does not impair uh, either the liquidity or the solvency of their operation. Now, again, I'm taking an extreme example here. It wouldn't look exactly like this on a bank's balance sheet, but roughly speaking, they do something like this, right? They have customers who come in and they offer $5,000 in uh, one-year CDs. The customers come in and they say, no, I don't want a five-year CD, I want a one-year CD. They have intentions to you know, get the money back, principal plus interest, and then buy something in a year. And so the bank takes those funds and they make one-year loans. Okay. They get a higher interest rate because the savers aren't you know, investing their own uh, labor effort and other resources into looking at all the dossiers of the different investable projects and trying to figure out which one to lend to. The bank is absorbing that, right? They're, and they're better at it. They're more efficient, presumably, because uh, they're engaged in the division of labor to do this. They're experts in it. Okay, now it doesn't have to, uh, again, it wouldn't have to look exactly like this. There, there could be some uh, reasonable variation, that's done, some reasonable leveraging that's done. That, but again, we'll set that aside just for the point of seeing the two, the, the two extremes, right? What, what would the 100% reserve banking system look like? What would the fractional reserve banking system look like? <clears throat> uh, okay, so the liquidity is still uh, uh, intact here. The bank is not illiquid at all in doing this. The time structure of their assets and liabilities matches exactly. When they have a $5,000 obligation to pay in one year, they'll have a $5,000 asset. The loan will be paid back and they'll have the money. So no problem, right? 
As long as they make sound loans, then they're still solvent, right? And this is what they're in the business to do, to, to make sound loans, to make loans that'll be paid back. So nothing, there's nothing inherent in, the, uh, in this operation that would impair the financial condition of the bank. <clears throat> okay, now when the banks do this, what's the effect on the broader economy? Well, there's, we, we would call this uh, the absence of credit expansion. There's no credit expansion. So notice uh, in this analysis, we're able to give precise definitions to monetary inflation and credit expansion. These are very important phenomena in the real world, and we need to have pre uh, precise analytical uh, uh, definitions. So as we saw before, uh, monetary inflation is not every increase in the supply of money. We can have an increase in the supply of money as long as it's brought forth by an increase in demand for money that makes the production of money more profitable. That would not be monetary inflation. That would just be an increase in the supply of money that's meeting demand. Um, and the same with credit expansion. We can have an increase in the supply of credit and a driving down of the interest rate in this system, but only if people's time preferences go down. So if people's time preferences go down, they'll save more, the supply curve for credit will shift to the right, and there'll be some uh, diminution in the demand for credit, right? If time preferences go down, some people will borrow less, and on balance, the interest rate will be lower and the supply of credit traded in the market will be larger. So we can have an increase in credit in the market without having what we'll call, we'll define it in a minute, what we'll call credit expansion. This is just a natural increase in credit that comes about because our preferences have changed. Just like an increase in the production of money because our preferences to hold money have increased, the, the corresponding increase in the production of money would not be monetary inflation. So. So this, this system, uh, this uh, market system, this pure market system then, would not experience monetary inflation and it would not experience credit expansion. It, 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 it simply can't occur in this system. Well, of course, there could be entrepreneurial errors and so on, right? But it's not systematic uh, in this system. <clears throat> okay, now let's turn to the issue of fiduciary media. <clears throat> Uh, and here we're rely relying on uh, Ludwig von Mises' uh, terminology. So this is how we define fiduciary media. Fiduciary media are money substitutes for which a bank holds only a fraction of money reserve. So we saw in the 100% reserve system, in the market system, in the pure market system, um, uh, th there, there would always be uh, an equivalent money reserve being held by the bank um, corresponding to the issue of its checkable deposits or whatever form the money substitutes come in. Fiduciary media is different in, than in this respect, right? It, so the bank is only holding a fraction of its uh, checkable deposits as money reserve. So we get fractional reserve banking. And uh, this, this uh, uh, um, uh, instance of uh, fractionally backed money uh, substitutes uh, Mises like to call fiduciary media. So anytime a bank is holding only a fraction of reserve, and again, this is, we don't mean by mistake. Again, a bank could just mistakenly do this, right? Uh, not make good entrepreneurial predictions, but we mean systematically it's done this. Now the question then arises as to how, how does this fiduciary media come into existence? And the answer is the uh, bank simply lends it into existence. They just, they just create it out of thin air. As my example indicates, they start with a $1,000 money reserve, a cash reserve. They start as a 100% reserve, let's assume, with 1,000 in checkable deposits. How do these checkable deposits get from 1,000 to 10,000? Well, they just, the bank just make, lo make, they make loans to their customers of $9,000. A customer comes in and says, you know, I want to buy, uh, or I want to uh, you know, buy some new capital equipment for my business. And they check the person's credit, history and they say, okay, that, that looks like a, a reasonable loan to us. And they'll just write the balance of the loan into their checking account. Okay? They're just creating the funds out of thin air. Notice they're not intermediating anything here, right? That, that's the point. That's, that's the basic economic difference here. They're not intermediating created credit. They're not, they're not borrowing it from anybody. They're just creating it out of thin air and lending it to, to someone else. <clears throat> oh, okay, so that's the basic 
principle, the basic distinguishing principle of fiduciary media. Okay, now once we have fiduciary media, we can have monetary inflation. Now we can define uh, monetary inflation in a, in a systematic uh, way. And let's run through the uh, economic analysis of this, and th then we'll provide a kind of uh, a summary definition of monetary inflation. <laughs> the thing to notice here is that the issue of fiduciary media, since it's done through credit creation out of thin air, the issue of fiduciary media cannot be regulated by profit and loss. It's always profitable for a bank to issue another loan where they create the funds out of thin air because the bank earns the interest on the loan and they don't have to pay any, anybody to borrow the money. So they're not earning an interest rate spread anymore. They're earning the full rate of interest as revenue. And it costs them very little to issue the loan, right? They have to, they have loan origination fees or whatever. And, Right, so they have some, some minimal cost to uh, issue the loan itself that, that corresponds to the revenue stream of the interest they get on that loan. So notice if they took the rule, if the bank took the rule, we're going to issue every loan, we're going to create every loan that we can possibly create out of thin air that generates profit for the bank, if they took that as their rule of production, then they would immediately bankrupt the bank, right? They, they would issue a billion dollars worth of credit, and uh, because every additional loan that they issue is profitable for them, and uh, this would, this would uh, force them almost directly into bankruptcy, because eventually they would have to, you know, after the first tens of millions, they would eventually have to loan to people that they know aren't going to pay back, right? Very, very, uh, you know, risky uh, extension of the loans. They'll be, they'll be creating this illiquidity in the bank that they can't manage any longer, and a certain degree of insolvency. So they can't take that as the rule of deciding how much fiduciary media to issue. <clears throat> they have to regulate this issue of fiduciary media uh, now by not by the rule of profit and loss, but but by some policy. They have to say, look, we won't we won't uh, we'll put our uh, uh, asset to, to equity ratios. We'll, we'll only extend them so far. We'll only leverage up to this point, and then we'll stop. Just, just some sort of a practical rule like this that they'll, they'll impose upon themselves. And uh, as Mises points out in 30 Money and Credit, this rule will depend upon circumstances. <laughs> It'll depend upon the, the, the way in which the government has I intervened in, in the banking system. You know, the extent to which the banks can extend their fiduciary issue will just depend upon circumstances of government intervention and so on. So there's no, there's no economic law about this. It's just a practical a question as to how far this can extend. Uh, and, and then finally, let me point, let me, uh, point out another aspect of this. This is the middle uh, bullet point. When the bank uh, creates money out of thin air and they extend a loan to someone else, notice they do not compensate the people who bear the opportunity cost in society of the person who gets this loan and is able to buy things with the funds. When a bank intermediates credit, they persuade someone else to reduce their spending by lending them the money. And then they compensate them by paying interest. And then they lend that same money to someone else who then can use it without any sort of uh, inconsistency in the overall demand for resources in society. Right? They've just transferred the purchasing power from the saver to the investor, and they've compensated the saver. So the saver says, I'm perfectly happy to wait and not spend my money. I'm perfectly happy to do that uh, in compensation for the interest the bank pays me. But when the bank issues fiduciary media, they don't do that, right? They just issue fiduciary media, they make a loan to somebody, that person goes out and buys things and they displace some other buyer who the bank does not compensate. Right? This, this is a, a difference. We get a different economic effect then of the issue of fiduciary media. By the way, that effect is very similar to what happens when, when a government just engages in the uh, printing of fiat paper money. It's print fiat paper money out of thin air, right? And they go and they spend it, and now the government gets the resources, and then some of the rest of us are displaced. We didn't consent to this, that's not, right? That's not how the market works. We didn't form some sort of contractual arrangement to lower our consumption in order to provide these resources to the state. So it's a similar kind of effect that fiduciary issue generates. <clears throat> okay, so let's now turn to the uh, financial effects. 
And these, again, are not uh, really uh, highly disputed uh, in the literature. <clears throat> the issue of fiduciary media makes banks illiquid, as we mentioned. There's now a systematic uh, mismatch of the time structure of assets and liabilities. Again, if, we, uh, if you return in your mind to that um, T account that I gave you of the bank, having uh, 1,000 in money reserve and 9,000 in loans and 10,000 in checkable deposits, they now have $10,000 in instant liabilities against them, and yet the loan structure will, will uh, be time-bound, right? Their loans won't be paid back until the borrower uh, fulfills the agreement to pay back the loan in a year or five years or 10 years. So, so they've systematically created illiquidity on their balance sheet that now has to be sort of artificially managed. They can't, it, it's unavoidable, right? They can't, they can't uh, uh, move to a position, once they issue fiduciary media, they can't move to a position where they're fully liquid as they would be in 100% reserve. And banks also become less solvent, at least if not insolvent. Eventually they become insolvent, but they become less solvent in the following way. The banks, if they're 100% reserve, then they've intermediated their credit and they've made the loans to the uh, best investable projects that uh, exist in the market that they're aware of. They've made the loans to the best, uh, in the best areas that they perceive. Now, if they want to issue credit out of thin air, if they want to increase their loan portfolio by 20%, they have to extend loans to less creditworthy projects. There's no, there's no other possibility, right? They have to extend the loans to people they were unwilling to give loans to when they restricted themselves to financial intermediation. But those loans are less likely to pay back. And so, and so it makes them less solvent, right? It becomes a problem that now that they have to manage. They can't avoid this again. <laughs> Uh, that they don't have if they're just engaged in 100% reserve banking. They, they, there they have problems of people not paying back loans, but they don't have this extra problem, right, that they must extend loans to people that uh, are less creditworthy. <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, this uh, becomes a problem. Now, in the broader economy, what happens is that financial markets become more volatile then. If banks can create credit out of thin air, then some of the borrowing that, that's done that wouldn't be done otherwise is spent to buy assets. So homeowners come in and they borrow more for mortgages and they bid up the prices of houses. And this sets in motion then uh, the imputation process that Professor Salerno has spoken about a couple of times. So now uh, lumber prices go up and cement prices go up and then timberland prices go up and so on and so forth. And investment then moves toward uh, expanding uh, capital capacity in the production of lumber mills and forest land and lumberjacks and chainsaws and uh, roofing material and so on and so forth to build more houses. And we get these lines of boom in the economy. We get these, these lines of excessive uh, malinvestment, mal, uh, investment uh, that proves in the long run to be uh, excessive in these uh, uh, particular lines that are driven by uh, credit uh, creation. <clears throat> and then finally, I put up uh, this other point that this process actually not only affects financial markets or asset prices uh, throughout the economy, but it, but it makes the banks themselves, whether or not they engage in the process of credit creation, it makes the banks themselves um, unstable. It makes the whole system unstable. Again, what happens is the credit creation, let's say if it goes into mortgages, drives housing prices up. Now, if, I'm, if I own a bank and I haven't engaged in this credit creation, I've still made loans on houses, and now the asset values of those loans go up, right? The asset, on my balance sheet, if I'm carrying my assets at market, the, the value goes up. And now I have equity. And, you know, if I'm just sitting on uh, excessive equity, I'm liable just to start making loans, right? Because I actually have equity now. Th this is what homeowners did. Right? This isn't confined to the banks. This is what homeowners did when, when the housing bubble occurred. You know, you were out in Vegas and you bought your house in 1960 for $25,000. And then, uh, you know, during the boom in 2006, uh, the, it was a million dollar house. And you had a mortgage or whatever, you know. Well, you probably paid your mortgage off completely. You now have a, a million dollars of equity in that house. And people were running down to the bank to borrow second mortgages, right, against their equity. And then what happens eventually, right, is the asset price is correct and everybody's underwater. 
And, and so even the sound part of the banking system can be affected by this. It just, again, uh, it, it uh, creates this possibility. Uh, uh, not just credit creation uh, institutions uh, uh, pay the price for this. <clears throat> Okay, now uh, let's just uh, then run through the, the, uh, th these uh, uh, phenomena of uh, monetary inflation and uh, credit expansion. So here, here would be the chart of monetary inflation that we get in this system. Here the demand for money has not changed at all, and the production of money uh, would be you know, no, no more profitable or, uh, than it was before. But the banks are simply creating uh, money substitutes out of thin air and putting a greater stock of money uh, in, into the market. Right through uh, extending credit to people, and then these people are taking, they're buying their houses, and then that money is going to the construction companies, and they're paying their workers, and the workers are going and they're buying new cars, and so on and so forth. And prices overall in the economy uh, begin to move up as the purchasing power of money moves down. So now we have a, 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 a sort of systematic, analytical uh, way of defining monetary inflation. It, it's an increase in the money supply that occurs outside the confines of economic calculation. It's just not according to economic calculation. Right? It's just arbitrary with respect to um, uh, the normal uh, entrepreneurial process of economic calculation. And it leads to the uh, 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 continuous uh, uh, decrease in the uh, purchasing power of money. It explains that uh, phenomenon. <clears throat> and then a similar thing happens with uh, credit. So we can uh, 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 the companion uh, activity is going on with credit creation. We have a certain demand for credit. It's not changing, or we can just assume it's not changing. But the supply of credit can be continually increased, regardless of what happens to demand for credit, right? Regardless of what happens to time preference. We're assuming here that nothing has happened to time preference. It's just that banks are creating credit out of thin air. Now, that credit will have to uh, push interest rates down to clear the market. Banks don't really care if the interest rates are pushed down, because remember, on created credit, they're earning the full rate of interest. So it's better to earn 3% than nothing. And if they issue enough credit creation to push interest rates down to 2%, still better to earn 2% than nothing, right? So they do it. They have monetary incentive to do this. And so again, we can give a, a technical uh, analytic definition to uh, a systematic definition, one that's useful for our purposes of doing analytics, to credit creation. It's an increase in the supply of credit outside the confines of economic calculation. It's not, it's not based on a change in our preferences at all, but just on this uh, ability of fractional reserve banks to issue uh, fiduciary media. <clears throat> now, let me close with uh, one, one last uh, uh, point. And, uh, and then, though, I'll have a one last, uh, we'll see if it turns out to be a mystery quote or not, but I do have one last quote to show you. Uh, anyway, this is the uh, question of, uh, okay, so now we've just done the economics of fractional reserve banking, right? We've just done a comparative study, comparative analysis. W what would happen in a market economy that had 100% um, uh, reserve banking, commodity money? What would happen in a market economy that had fiduciary media? And, and w we can still assume it has commodity money, but it has fiduciary media, right? So we've done that analysis. We, we might turn just briefly to the question of, uh, Okay, so that's an interesting uh, sort of abstract uh, uh, imaginary comparison. But what would real markets generate? Would, would real markets generate a fractional reserve uh, relationship? You know, would they generate a banking system like this? Or would they generate something like a 100% reserve system? And obviously, again, this depends upon legal questions that, as I said before, we're not going to go into. Uh, so so uh, it, it's a much more complicated question that I'm uh, alluding to uh, in my quick answer. But uh, what I would say uh, in, uh, in answer to this is, <clears throat> uh, we mentioned this earlier, the, if, if we had, we know the logic of the development of banking is it's going to develop money certificates first. Right? Initially, they're going to be money certificates. Because that's necessary to build a clientele for the, for the for the use of the money certificate as a medium of exchange. And so any bank that wants to issue fiduciary media will have to be competing against banks that are you know, issuing money certificates. Can they develop a clientele, in other words? Will merchants at large accept their fractionally backed uh, money substitutes instead of money certificates? Or will the merchants refuse and require the money certificates? 
Right? That, that seems to be the issue. And uh, again, it, it, uh, since the banks cannot reward merchants in general for using fiduciary issue, they can reward their customers. Right? They can pay their customers uh, interest, but they can't pay you, you know, a, a non-customer interest. Uh, it seems unlikely that fraction reserve banking would develop uh, in a market economy, uh, you know, again, we can imagine different legal configurations where it would happen, but that would be then, we, we'd have to do the analysis to see whether or not that was an intervention in the economy or part of the private property system. Okay, at that point, I'll uh, stop. Thank you. Thank you.